All right. Hello, uh, Phil1300. Uh, this video is pertaining to your section test two. The first thing I'm going to say is that my apologies, it took me so long um, to turn around your previous assignment. Um, many of you wrote quite a bit, and um, it, it, because these tests are substantial. And uh, when people write a lot for me, I'd like to give myself the time to um, substantively consider and uh, respond to that. So you've seen from my comments uh, that um, I was rather extensive um, pointing out areas where you can improve that sort of thing. I mean this therapeutically. Don't get sort of upset with me or anything along those lines. Because um, really what I'm trying to do is um, help you to make your arguments better, which um, it's important in the context of market modern society that we continue to insist that our arguments be substantial ones and good ones and insist that we be able to evaluate arguments when they're presented to us because more than any other historical period in time, more people and more frequently ourselves were encountering these kinds of arguments and these kinds of arguments um, really count as people telling us what to do. So in the context of an ethics class, each of these theorists is trying to tell you what to do. You should read it carefully, understand what they're trying to require of you, and then critically assess uh, the, the, the prescriptions that these theorists are making. Um, in your work-a-day, walk-a-day life, you're going to have bosses and co-workers and friends and random trolls on the internet and um, that sort of thing trying to make arguments, trying to make arguments to change your beliefs and trying to, more importantly, make arguments that change the way that you choose and the way that you act. Now, if we're going to make a space for freedom, as I think we should, really freedom is best exhibited when uh, we, we assert some sort of level of independence right, over these kinds of arguments. And that's what these classes are supposed to actually aid and enhance, is your ability to think and act in a free way. Right? So um, that's why I'm harping on this. Um, with regard to the time for turnaround, um, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, I could offer less in the way of feedback and commentary and turn these around fairly quickly, but then I'm not responding properly in the context of a writing intensive course. And right? You need the feedback, you need the comments, and uh, maybe it's my background in philosophy, but for me uh, and a lot of my colleagues who I've talked to about this, <sighs> well, maybe I should just speak for myself. I will no, almost always sacrifice speed for substance right? uh, when, it, when it comes to offering commentary, when it, when it comes to making and formulating arguments or presentations or what have you. I'm not just going to do a quick job. I'm going to try and do it well. So, to that end, um, uh, what I've done and what you've probably noticed is I've actually changed your um, due date for this assignment. Uh, you normally have five days, right? Um, I've given you an extra week on this assignment. Um, this is partially my way of saying I'm sorry uh, for the length of time that it took me to turn around your previous assignment, though there are no hard and fast rules about this. Um, there are strong suggestions that we should be quick about um, turning this over. But in the con like I say, in the context of a writing intensive course, I mean, if I'm going to read, consider, and comment really your previous assignment, I was doing three an hour, maybe. And some of the longer ones would take me 40 minutes, right? So I'd only get two done an hour. Um, there's only so much of me to go around, right? Um, it, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, I'm giving you more time as sort of an apology for the amount of time I took with the, um, the grading. The second reason I'm doing this, um, I just earlier addressed because you should take the time to carefully consider this material, these questions, and carefully craft your responses. So the idea is you should use this 
extra time. Use it. Because, right, one of the things that I noticed in some of the, not all, but some of the assignments that I was reading last time, uh, grammatical and typographical errors. Um, I noticed that some of you ran out of time and your responses were very substantial at the beginning and the last questions uh, were rather short and quick. Um, the other thing that I'm going to point out is that uh, the video material that I post on Moodle, it's required content. Right? Um, I consider it the same as readings. If you're in the online class, my videos are the same as coming to class. And you're, if you're in my on-campus class, then, well, come to class, right? So that we can discuss this material and, and come to um, a, a more substantial and grounded sort of understanding of uh, the dynamics and debates that are going on. So um, for this test, um, there are three books, but look how skinny they are. Um, and, Oddly, this On Liberty, um, I just had a publisher ask me if I would like to adopt his new um, uh, if, if translation, his new version of Mills on Liberty. He's very excited about it. It costs 14 bucks. This costs eight. All right. So um, I'm, I'm not trying to make you break the bank by um, buying three books. It's just, you know, it's where the arguments are. Right. Um, and it's how I draw you into a discussion and debate about this material. Now, um, the book, first book is Kant's Grounding to the Metaphysic of Morals, and there's not actually a ton of reading in this little thing, but um, it is sort of difficult and nuanced material um, that, that frequently... I, I think back to when I was taking intro to ethics, and shh, don't tell anybody this, but... I didn't have that firm an understanding of this material when I read, went to write an exam on it. Um, it. By the time I wrote a paper for that course, and that's back when you could write a paper for a course, um, it, I, I developed a firmer grasp of what was going on with regard to the categorical imperative. It did well on this class, but nonetheless, um, it, my first kick at Kant, I misunderstood um, some of the nuanced positions that he's arguing. Um, it, so it requires time and careful consideration. Um, and then these two arguments um, by John Stuart Mill, one in Utilitarianism, and we're reading chapters one, two, and three. Um, chapter one is almost nothing. There's a critique of Kant in there. Um, chapter two is where a lot of the substance of the the, the Mill argument um, comes from in chapter three it pertains to the, the ultimate sanction of the principle of utility that is why we should um, calculate the greatest good for the greatest number rather than for example the greatest good for me which we're generally non-ethically speaking trying to do right when I'm spending money I'm trying to decide where to get the most bang for my buck Right? And that's a utilitarian calculation, but not an ethical calculation insofar as it's not the greatest good for the greatest number. Right? Anyhow, um, that's utilitarianism, and then we're just reading the first chapter of Mills on Liberty, um, where he introduces the principle of harm and um, the essential human liberties, and oddly creates sort of a utilitarian argument for each of those essential human liberties. And um, it, it presents us with a notion of political rights. Right? Um, so the big distinction between these two theorists is, you know, we are worthy of dignity and respect for Kant just on the basis of our rational autonomy and our humanity. Right? So all human beings are do this. Um, whereas for Mill on liberties, he's talking about political liberties. He's talking about civil liberties, right? So um, with regard to Mill and Mill's arguments, he's presenting a utilitarian argument about how best to structure society, who has these liberties, who should have these rights, members of that society. So our rights stem from a political sort of compact rather than from any sort of intrinsic value to our humanity. Right? So that's a big distinction between these two. Something you should have in the back of your mind as you're answering these kinds of questions. 
So, um, it, your test, which is posted to Moodle, um, has all of the same boilerplate from um, the, 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 the last test, uh, uh, Phil 1300 section test two. Again, uh, it's November 13th. I've given you lots of time. It's like 12 days um, to engage with this material. Right? There's six questions, that's two days a question. Right? So you've got the time to really consider your responses. Right? Um, readings are Kant's Grounding, the preface in sections one and two, uh, Mill's Utilitarianism, chapters one, two, and three, Mill's on Liberty, section one, and then all of the video material that I've posted to Google. Um, that's designed to help you, um, but it's also required content. And you'll see um, I've actually asked a couple of questions pertaining to it um, in this round. Um, so, short answer questions, um, two par paragraphs for each, uh, each question. I define paragraphs um, as a minimum of um, three sentences. Um, that, that's pretty minimal though. The idea here, the reason I put that requirement on is because I was getting one and two sentence responses to my questions and it's just, it's just not sufficient, right? So I put a minimum requirement so that even the people that give me the minimum have actually been required to provide some form of substance, right? So, um, but the minimum is there, um, not as sort of a bound. It, it, the idea is consider these responses and I would, as a rule of thumb, figure that um, three quarters, two thirds of a page would be appropriate for these. Um, on the last test, some of you wrote more, some of you wrote way less. Um, so anyhow, um, full sentences don't do point form. I have to interpret point form, and if I have to interpret it, it's not clear. Um, so, uh, there are three questions on Kant, two on Mill, and then um, one comparative argumentative kind of question on this one. I'm switching it up just slightly. All right. um, so, Kant argues in the preface to the grounding that a metaphysics of morals is necessary since, quote, what it, is, uh, what it is to be morally good that it conforms with the moral law is not enough. Introducing this position, discuss why Kant would argue this. What does this tell you about the basis for Kantian morality? That is, what makes an action morally good? Right? Oddly, that kind of relates to my paragraph requirement. That you conform to it isn't enough. Right? That you provide a substantive response is more valuable. But anyhow, now Kant's up to something a little bit different here. Um, remember the big distinction between Mill and Kant is that for um, Kantian morality, it's deontological, it's deed-oriented. It's the intention that stands behind the action that determines the moral quality of the action. Right? And the only intention that really winds up being a moral intention for Kant, uh, he introduces at the beginning of section one, as um, a goodwill. So what does he mean by that? What does that mean about the way that we estimate morality? All right, so anyhow, that's that question unpacked a little bit. Um, question number two in his discussion of the first formulation of the categorical imperative. And, oh, look, I quote it for you. Act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Kant draws a distinction between perfect and imperfect duties introduce the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties, briefly illustrating with examples. Examples, you see. Um, feel free to use Kant's examples. Um, and don't give me all four of them because you'll be writing for a week. Um, and mind you, you've got 12 days, but it, don't, don't spend that all on one question. Um, it basically, I want to see you apply uh, the formulation of the categorical imperative to a case in order to, one, actually meet the cross-cutting capacities of this course, right, about how this moral, moral theory would apply to your life, and two, uh, that you demonstrate through um, your application of this formulation that you actually know what the heck's going on, right, so that's why I'm doing that. Um, remember, the distinction between perfect and imperfect duties has to do with the mechanics of how it's applied. I introduced that in the, uh, the video 
Um, or if you're in the on-campus class, we've spent some time on that, distinguishing between perfect and imperfect duties. Um, his four examples are the person that's considering suicide, the person who's considering issuing a false promise on the perfect side. And the imperfect side, um, the person who's considering allowing his talents to rust, and um, the one that I call the miser, you know, the person who says, uh, you know, I see people who I could help suffering, but what's it to me? And um, I'm not kicking them while they're down, but I have no desire to help them. And, and that example actually illustrates an imperfect duty. Right. Um, now, what I'm not looking for for that question is the idea that perfect duties are a strong form of moral obligation and that imperfect duties um, are a weak form of moral obligation. Underline the word not. I'm not looking for that. I want to see how we determine what a perfect duty is versus what an imperfect du duty is and um, by the mechanics of this first formulation of the categorical imperative. Then I want to see some examples. So um, that's question two. Question three, Kant introduces the humanity principle, and I quote it for you, um, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or the person of another, always as an end in itself and never merely as a means. That's the principle. He introduces this as a formula, another formulation of the categorical imperative. The principle, he argues, rests on the dignity of human beings. He argues that human beings are, quote, objects of respect on page 36. Why are human beings, according to Kant, objects of respect? Now, I'm going to point out to you, Michael Sandel does a great job of introducing this position. Excellent job in his Mind Your Motive video. That's the one with Spider-Man there. Um, second part of the question, how does this position naturally follow, as Kant argues it does, from the first formulation of the categorical imperative? And in my video I actually do um, discuss the, 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 the movement from the first to the second. Look what we're doing in the first. Isn't that neat, right? We're exhibiting this special kind of Kantian freedom. Well. That establishes us as beings that are marked off as different, right? And um, as Kant points out, I want to say it's page 36, it might be 34, let's see, no, it's 34, um, uh, but let us, uh, 35 rather, but let us suppose that there were something whose existence has in itself absolute worth something which is an end in itself um, could be the ground of determinate laws in it and in it in it alone would there um, would there be the uh, ground of a possible categorical imperative that is a practical law so 35 i've just given you the passage where he makes that transition right hey look what we're doing so anyhow i want to see how he gets from the first formulation of the categorical imperative to the second on the basis of that special notion of freedom that Sandel does a good job of introducing. So um, that's Kant, right? And you can shake your fist at him in the rearview mirror once you're done these questions. Um, he's in the rearview mirror, save for I asked you to do something comparative at the end here. Two questions on Mill. Um, Mill modifies Bentham's initial position in two main respects. In the first, Mill finds it necessary to make a distinction between quantitative and qualitative analysis of pleasures. Discuss the principle of utility generally, like introduce the principle of utility. Right? And explain this distinction, um, discussing why Mill argues that it is necessary a necessary addition to utilitarian morality. That is, what specific criticism of utilitarian morality is it intended to address? And again, in the Michael Sandel putting a price tag on life video, in the second part, he addresses these criticisms, right? And the specifically the specific criticism has to do with comparing apples to oranges. Right? Is it possible to 
aggregate all value to a single standard of measure. All right? I just gave it to you. That's, that's why these videos are important to screen. Um, question five, Mill introduces the notion of political liberty in his On Liberty to address a specific criticism of the principle of utility related to individual human rights, rights, which was introduced by Michael Sandel, Justice Episode 2, posted to Moodle. Introduced the notion of political liberty advanced by Mill, and I've already given you a bit of that earlier in this video, um, and discuss how this notion might respond uh, to the criticism introduced by Sandel. Right. So, anyhow, you should have lots and lots of um, lots and lots of material to answer that. Sandel introduces two criticisms of utilitarian morality that Mill then responds to. The second part of Sandel's video goes into how Mill responds to those criticisms. I do it in my video as well. So, um, yeah, you should have lots and lots for that. Then your final question. Rick Roderick, in his video, Kant and the Path to Enlightenment, makes the following claim regarding both Kantian and utilitarian morality. I don't know why everybody does Mill then Kant when they introduce this material. It's anachronistic, right? But anyhow, um, Roderick did, right? and uh, anyhow, right? that's what he did. Here's his claim. And I'll see if I can't do a Roderick impression. In fact, these two moral theories, in terms of just pure moral theories, still dominate the standard philosophical discussion, okay? Now, it's clear to me that one of them is more interesting than the other. I think you know which one is more interesting to me. Crad laughs, right? It's, it's clearly in the can to the path to enlightenment video, right? So, but, I've got to warn you that there are knockdown objections to both, and by knockdown objections, I mean knockdown objections. We know that these theories are wrong because there are knockdown objections to them. The best way to look at both of them, however, might be as models for moral action. By models, we don't mean the shopping mart idea of something that we do once in a while, but as a way to think about a moral life, if you're interested in it. So he's introducing both of these moral theories, Kantian and Utilitarian, as models for moral action. So your question, what does, Rick, uh, what does Roderick mean by calling these theories models for moral action. It would seem that either Roderick is right or he's wrong. Right? Are these models or are these practical guides? The practical guides, he's wrong. If these are models, he's right. In either case, it would come down to making an argument. So that's your job. Supporting your position with an argument, one that makes use of your understanding of the material studied in this course, how would you respond to this assessment of Kantian and utilitarian model of uh, morality? Now, if you want to argue that the utilitarians offer a practical guide to living a moral life, then what you have to do is defend utilitarian morality against these kinds of criticisms. Right? And yeah, I'll point out to you, I, 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 the people in my online class got a video about this, um, and the people in my own campus class will get a rigmarole on this. It seems as though Mill's defense of utilitarianism so drastically changes utilitarianism that a lot of people argue it's no longer utilitarianism. So in responding to the criticisms of utilitarian morality, John Stuart Mill has turned utilitarianism into something that is not utilitarianism. That is, he's added a good number of Kantian principles to it. All right. So 
that might indicate that there is some sort of problem at the heart of utilitarian morality. Right. Now, on the other hand, um, there are lots and lots of criticisms of Kantian morality. Immediately after this passage, Roderick leaps into one of the classic critiques of Kantian morality. Right. Here's the thing, right? How do we feel about a moral theory that doesn't matter, and by which it doesn't matter how things work out? Right? It's the principle of the thing rather than the outcome of the action, because we actually want to benefit actual human beings, right? <laughs> so it seems that there are these criticisms. So in making your argument, you might have to defend one of these positions against these kinds of criticisms, right? If you want to argue that Roderick is wrong and that these are practical guides for life lived, right? If you want to argue that Roderick is right, you might want to illustrate how, well, interesting and in offering insights these theories do, right? Still, they limit themselves and you can follow Roderick's argument and enhance it with your own understanding of these positions as you go, right? So, um, that's your task. I want to actually see an argument here, right? And you might ask, uh, well, an argument, that's just my opinion, right? How, how are you going to grade that? Is, is it wrong to have my opinion? No, your opinion's not wrong. It, we're going to be somewhat Socratic with this. It's everybody's, like, it, like Roderick points out, right? It, you know, like noses, just about everybody's got an opinion, right? They have their right to their opinion. Uh, to believe, as Roderick would say, any damn fool thing they want to believe. But if we're going to have a discussion, right, then we have to evaluate these beliefs and opinions in terms of the reasons offered in support for them, right? If you have an opinion and you just pull it out of the sky, right? Well, you can't have a philosophical argument about it, right? It ceases to be an argument, right? If, as Roderick would point out, that's what I believe, God damn it, right? You're not gonna convince me otherwise. Well, we're not doing philosophy anymore, and maybe this, this, this kind of class is the wrong kind of venue. Right. In order to actually engage in philosophy, largely we have to evaluate the reasons that support our beliefs and opinions. Right. So that's, that's your goal here. Right. Um, you, I'm going to evaluate what you submit in terms of the strength of your argument. How well do the reasons that you offer support your position? Note also that I, I don't care if I agree with you or not. I don't care, right? Just that, one, you're providing a faithful interpretation of this material, two, that you've communicated it clearly, and three, you see the way that reasons support beliefs or opinions, right? It's so, I, I mean, effectively, right, it, it, the strength of your argument is something that I've, I've, I've got advanced degrees in how to evaluate, so, I mean, they're criteria. Right. Anyhow, um, if you have any questions, that, 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 that my posting this now means that um, you not only have the Thursday, um, where's my calendar, um, Thursday, uh, November 2nd, but also Thursday, November 9th, um, to come to my um, office hours. So, um, you, so you got that going for you, right? But on top of that, um, you've got a ton of time to work on this material. Make use of the forums as well. Um, I have no problem if you ask a question related to the um, exam in the context of a forum because the, uh, our understanding of this material should be something public and developing and you know really involve having arguments with one another. That's a perfectly valid way to use the forums and get additional grades for having enhanced your knowledge for the test, right? So um, it also, if, if you're not up to date on those forms, get up to date on those forms. If you're not up to date on 
the video content for this material, get up to date on the video content for the material, and if you've got questions that you can't address on your own, let me know, um, and I will try my best to help you. All right, um, I look forward to reading your responses, and uh, have good days, one for each of you.